this is my my name is Joel Williamson. Uh, this is my first time at Porkfest, and uh, I never thought that uh, that would include me speaking at it too. So uh, it's very flattering if that's the case. So thank you, Jack, for the opportunity, and um, thank you, Nick, also for helping put this thing on. So give these guys a round of applause. Otherwise, we wouldn't uh, have all text though. So I'm going to rely a bit on my notes here. Actually, quite a bit on my notes here. This is a sort of a, uh, one of my one of my first times public speaking. So, just to, yeah, give you a heads up. And I'm competing with the guy from Reason. I think the guy over at the other place over there is yeah. So, but that's the market. Don't be unreasonable. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm from Austin, Texas. A little background of who I am. I started an organization called Alliance of Austin Agorists, and what we do is we host monthly networking parties. Uh, for people, uh, for all products, skills, and services. So if you have either three of those things, we create an environment for you to uh, barter, trade, and, 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 and sell things. Um, we also have a special guest come on who are um, knowledgeable of ideas surrounding agorism and uh, freedom in general. Uh, so far we've had the privilege of interviewing people like uh, Charles Johnson, uh, George Donnelly, uh, Taryn Lupo, Jack Schimmick, Jeffrey Tucker, and Cody Wilson. And uh, we have a lot of fun at these things and we continue to uh, go down that path. But anyways, um, my talk tonight is going to be an introduction to agorism. Uh, Jack's going to talk about it in greater length uh, later on. I highly encourage you to uh, watch that as well. Uh, but my goal tonight is, uh, or today, is to have you walk away with an introductory level uh, of understanding of agorism and counter-economics. So I'm guessing that some of you are interested or uh, slightly familiar with agorism or counter-economics, uh, but to start with, uh, I think it's appropriate to start with some definitions. Um, agorism is the ideology that libertarianism exists in the real world through the practice of counter-economics. And counter-economics can be defined as every non-coercive or non-violent action done in defiance of the state. So assuming that uh, computers uh, don't solve our problems, <laughs> Whereas this is an alternative uh, strategy to uh, get to a state of society. So the idea is instead of cooperating with government through traditional parliamentary means, um, agorism asks, asks us to create alternative market institutions that people can opt into. Uh, these institutions uh, will not be in um, overt competition with the government, rather covert competition with it as a multi-generational goal to achieve a market anarchist society also known as the Agora. Um, Agora, by the way, is a Greek word uh, that means uh, open marketplace or open place of assembly. Um, some think if we apply counter-economics correctly, we can reach the Agora in our lifetime, uh, but I tend to think uh, it's more realistic um, to, to look at Agorism as a multi-generational goal. Um, and then also a little history of the guy who thought of Agorism. And uh, Jack, please correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but this is going to be a, a brief history. Um, Jack knew the guy, actually. He was friends with him. Um, his name is Samuel Andrew Conkin III, and he's the gentleman responsible for creating the revolutionary market anarchist strategy that is agorism. Um, I highly encourage you to read his books if you haven't. Uh, New Libertarian Manifesto and Agorist Primer radically uh, redirected my strategic interests, and I know that I can do the same for you if you give it a shot. Um, anyways, I'm going to have him here for yourself. Uh, if you want one, let me know and we can get that in your hands. Um, but Samuel Edward Conkin III, or SEK3 as, would, would, uh, as his friends would call him, uh, was from the geographical area that they call Canada. And uh, he made his way to the States in the, in the 1960s, arguably where he discovered libertarianism. And uh, he started off, like a lot of his anarchists do, as something more of a minarchist. Um, he believed that libertarian change could, could manifest through traditional parliamentary politics. A long story short, after the parliamentary process proved to be ineffective, as something finally clicked, uh, Konkin realized that libertarianism meant nothing without the principle of consistency. Um, our goal is to have a freed market. If, if our goal is to have a freed market, it seems logical to use market means to achieve that goal. So in other words, um, you have to use libertarian means to achieve a libertarian end. Um, he finally embraced consistent libertarianism, realizing the political process was a betrayal of the, the, principle, uh, the libertarian principle of consistency, thus the idea of agorism was born. 
Um, it's unfortunate that he was unsuccessful in, in, uh, uh, in dissolving the liberty... Well, well, sorry, let me go back really quick. Oh, yeah. Although Konkin tried to redirect the Libertarian Party's um, strategic interests, uh, unfortunately, he uh, was unsuccessful, and I guess to no surprise to you at that time. Um, and the Libertarian Party essentially showed themselves to be agoraphobic. Uh, although he did manage to walk away with uh, a few radicals in agreement. Um, and it's unfortunate that he was unsuccessful in dissolving the Libertarian Party uh, also because I think it would be much further along as a movement um, if everyone at that time had realized what Konkin did and started practicing counter-economics. Um, we agorists are always trying to spread the gospel of Konkin. And I found that highlighting the fact that agorism is the most consistent version of libertarianism uh, really has an impact on people. Uh, so that's one of the things I'm going to touch on today. Um, hopefully I'll have you walk away with an agorist rock in your shoe. Um, agorism is the most consistent version of libertarianism because it asks us not only to think and preach libertarian ideas, but also to live them. Agorism is consistent because it is anarchistic. We take non-aggression to its logical conclusion, and I think for a lot of people, the, prin the principled universal application of non-initiatory violence is essential to fully grasping anarchism. Agorism is the consistent application of liberty because it says that we should not ask for permission to be free. Agorism says you are free, and I go live like it. And that's not to say that we should be reckless in our counter-economic endeavors either. As Konkin points out in New Libertarian Manifesto, um, basically, the, the key to mastering the art of agorism or counter-economics is, um, is measuring risk and profit. So, everyone knows that any, in any business venture that someone takes, um, you know, there's, there's going to be risk and profit. The majority of the time, the higher the risk, the greater the profit. And the way that this relates to counter-economics is um, the, uh, the risk of, from the state. So we're trying to get around the state entirely. So if your desired goal is X, and um, what, what you need to do, uh, or what we mean by risk and profit, is you need to figure out how likely it is that you're going to be caught doing that. And if you do uh, achieve X, what's the profit from achieving that? So that's measuring risk and profit. But um, agorism is, the cons is consistent because it asks us to use libertarian means to achieve libertarian ends. It's not about gradually repealing laws or using the political system to obtain libertarian goals. The goal of counter-economics is not to reform laws, but to evolve past the fact that government has a monopoly on law to begin with. Agorists, has, agorists have too much respect for law uh, for it to be in an unaccountable, violent monopoly's hands. Um, and I understand this uh, knee-jerk reaction that people have to uh, solving injustice. Um, you know, we often think that the only way to, uh, especially when it affects us directly, the only way that we're going to end government oppression is, is by begging our leaders to, to stop. Um, a good example of this is in Austin, uh, we have fluoride in our water. I don't know if uh, New Hampshire does, but uh, what a lot of people have done there, and you know, well-intended people who were my friends, uh, went to our local leaders and, and begged them to get uh, fluoride out of our water. Um, apparently fluoride is supposed to be pretty bad for you. Um, I know that some people, the scientists might prove me wrong, I'm sure. But uh, anyways, uh, assuming it were bad for you, <laughs> uh, they, they, they went to our, our local rulers and, and, and begged for them to take out the water. They've done this for some time and, and have been unsuccessful. The counter-economic solution to that, or what agorism would, would say to, about this, is, is, is instead of begging our local rulers to get fluoride out of our water, what you do is create a fluoride filter, okay? And sell these counter-economically. You know, for a family, a lower-income family that can't afford it, you give it away. Uh, for people who can't afford it, you can sell it. And that's some, sort of along the lines of, of what John Bush has done. And, uh, but that, that has, you know, it's, it's more fruitful, and it's, you know, direct, direct action gets the goods. Agorism is consistent anarchism because it recognizes that for us to be successful, our revolutionary acts done in defiance of the state should be peaceful. Ballots are as outdated and impractical as bullets are. I sympathize with these so-called anarchists who put bats through corporate windows and set fire to cop cars because I'm angry too. 
there's lots of reasons to be. However, it doesn't matter how righteous our anger may be, reverting to initiatory violence is counterproductive, reactionary, and impractical. It is true that the powers that be do everything to keep the productive class a permanent underclass, but we must be smarter before we grow stronger. And not all nonviolent acts done in defiance of the state are necessarily in our interest either. In fact, some, non some acts uh, can be considered counterproductive. Uh, certain acts of civil disobedience uh, really are as, as useful as gradualist methods, like voting. Uh, when reading L New Libertarian Manifesto, it's clear that uh, Gorism focuses primarily on outside the system activism and not inside the system activism. While things like confronting cops and, um, you know, uh, loading shotguns in gun-free zones and, and, and smoke down, uh, you know, smoke downs, a bunch of people getting together and smoking weed to, pro to protest the war on drugs is, uh, it can be, to, you know, considered a parts that technically make up the, or arguably make up the counter-economy. Um, they are examples of inside the system activism and that they are attempts to reform law, not to evolve past the law, that, and not, not to evolve past the fact that a violent monopoly produced that law to begin with. Um, I like to call this type of civil disobedience direct action gradualism. Uh, it, these types of things can certainly be exciting and can have uh, some temporary positive effects, but from a strictly agorist perspective, the value that these acts hold are usually purely educational. And I hope I'm not making agorism sound like a, an exclusive club either. I just want to be specific about what agorism and, and counter-economics are. Um, Unfortunately, sometimes we anarchists can find niche groups of like-minded people and create our uh, protective ideological tribes. And uh, it's, it's easy to, without realizing it, push other ways who aren't as intellectually perfect as we think we are. I know that I've been guilty of this in the past, but what can we do other than recognize our mistakes and move on? Try not to repeat them. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about next, is a, uh, address the fact that agorism is eclectic. So if the counter-economy is a sum total of all non-voluntary action done in defiance of the state, then we are certainly working under a large umbrella. Um, obviously, the Austrian school heavily influences agorism's economic understanding, but I would argue that it is certainly not limited to traditional proprietarian economics. Konkin, while skeptical of voluntary primitivism and communism, said that our evolution to a stateless society would include anarchists of all shapes and sizes. And really, how could it be any other way? Um, in an anarchist community, or in an anarchist, or in a stateless society, if, you're in, if you and your community reject the idea of personal and private property, great, that's your prerogative. However, you will be subject to indirect competition with communities who do find property to be legitimate, even if you don't believe in competition. Um, if your system proves to be more efficient, you naturally will attract more people, and it's likely that our counter, -economics, our counter economic efforts will mirror this. Uh, we anarchists have many different flavors and that's okay. Actually, it's necessary. So the idea is the anarcho-communists and the self-identified anarcho-capitalists, the socialists, the primitivists, the mutualists and individualists, all in cooperation, all in competition, together against the state. Agorism should appeal to all types of anarchists, and it's our job to recruit them and open their minds to the possibility of the real impact that counter-economics could have for all of us. There's not one counter-economic counter -economic graph to a stateless society, rather a family of graphs that will get us there. So in other words, counter-economics is for everyone. And the fact that agorism is eclectic makes it a practical strategy because there's power in numbers. However, this isn't the only reason that agorism is practical. Agorism is practical because it's the, it's the answer to the anarchist problem of how we get from here to there. It's, to, it's the response to the impossibility of parliamentary political methods for libertarian change. And I include the word parliamentary in front of, um, parliamentary in front of the word political because I'd like to point out the fact that agorism is not uh, necessarily anti-political, rather um, anti-parliamentary. Um, and um, agorism is a political philosophy because it is an attempt to bring about a new form of law, more specifically um, a polycentric form of law that's uh, subject to market competition. I got an opportunity to go to the uh, 
Texas Bitcoin conference not too long ago, and I ran into a, a few different libertarians there, uh, one of them being Jeffrey Tucker. Um, I set up a booth similar to this with uh, zines and books and my candles that I sell and shirts. And my friend um, Derek Bros was with me, and he, he told me that if I could strike up a conversation with Jeffrey Tucker about agorism, he would film it. So I, I, I had no idea what he thought about agorism. I just knew he was into Bitcoin. Um, so I managed to grab his attention. He was at the at the bar getting whiskey at the time, of course. And uh, he came over to our table, and I and I asked him about agorism, and he, he responded in an in an, ele in an elegant way that really stuck with me, and I wanted to uh, share that with you guys tonight. But what he said is, what agorism asks us to do is to control the parts of lives that we, of our lives that we can actually control and not waste our time on silly things that we cannot. We can't control the state, and once we realize that, our whole world shifts. We can scream at the politicians, yell at the government, participate in the democratic process, system, which is basically a ruse, or we can take charge of our own lives. We can't control the state, but we can control ourselves. And once we take control of our own lives and do it well, eventually that will determine our political future. So Jeffrey Tucker is pointing out an, an obvious fact of the, the practicality that outside the system counter-economics has. And uh, in, his word, it, in his words, it took him only 25 years to, to realize that. So uh, let's focus our time, money, and energy on what we can actually change. And, and, I encourage you to not waste 25 years of your life um, chasing your tail. Act now, anarchy awaits. Agorism is practical because we have historical examples of how useful black markets can be when it comes to providing for common people and oppressive governments. Uh, if anyone's interested in that, I, I encourage you to uh, look into what effect the black market had in the Soviet Union. Um, they weren't doing it necessarily to overthrow the state but they were doing it to survive. Um, and the counter economy there, or the black market there, was called the Malevo. Um, agorism is practical because it recognizes what slaves did with the Underground Railroad, which is to demonstrate that the path to freedom isn't always a legal one. And we really need to get rid of this, this top-down imposed guilt that government puts on us. Um, morality, or, or illegality does not necessarily mean immorality. I think we all know that. Agorism is, is practical because objects in motion remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Uh, in, in this example, the, that outside force, or the object, is, is government. And um, So what is that outside force? Is it a ballot? Um, is it running for office, gradually peeling back government to its appropriate size, magically eliminating it one day? I think not. Um, that outside force is the counter-economy. Agorism is practical, practical because it recognizes the fundamental differences between the interests of the state and the true interests of the people. I like the analogy of frogs in a boiling pot of water. So you've got these four frogs in a boiling pot of water with a cook who is slowly turning up the heat. Some of the frogs start becoming upset and demand that the cook lower the temperature to a more comfortable level, never realizing that the evil cook's interests and their interests are entirely different. Naturally, the cook turns down the heat, never intending to keep it at that level. This goes on and on with the frogs constantly negotiating with the cook until, until they finally die because they never realize that the water was getting hotter and hotter. And I understand that that is a slightly hyperbolic example, but I think it's practical on some level um, because it points out the, the, the evils of the state and, and what can happen if we don't wake up to the impossibility of uh, parliamentary uh, means of achieving libertarian ends. So the status frog enjoys the pot and blindly relishes in its luxuries. The anarchist frog recognizes that frogs don't belong in pots. What? Oh. The agorist frog wants us to jump out of the pot when the cook isn't watching. The status frog is concerned with potential violent beasts life outside, in the life outside, the, outside of the pot, free from the cook's protection. The anarchist frog says, life outside the pot is no guarantee that we will be protect protected from those who wish to coerce us, but life inside the pot is an absolute guarantee that some will. The agorist frog concurs and is actively mapping out potential paths to freedom. 
And if you followed me up to this point, you might be thinking, that's, that's great and all, but how do we actually practice counter-economics? Um, I can't quit my job. I've, I've got kids to feed. Well, my goal tonight um, is, is to help everyone understand real-life things that they can do to, to help build a counter, the, con the counter economy and pave the way to the Agora. So how do we practice counter-economics? The simple answer is you just do. Go out and be a revolutionary. But of course, that's not nearly specific enough. Uh, what we should do is measure risk, risk and profit, find market opportunities, and act. New Libertarian Manifesto lays out a, a likely Agora's phases that will get us from here to a stateless society. Um, but what authority is going to let us know that we're now entering phase three of the revolution? Such an authority does not exist. I like what Cody Wilson has to say about this, is we can't wait on God to be, to be on our side. All we can do is act. All we can do is build. It's easy to, to, to fall in, into despair against the... It's easy to fall into despair and, and think that you, you have no control, and it's, it's easy to feel hopeless against the powers that be and, and fall into the trap of, of couch potato libertarianism. But don't be that person. Uh, taking control of your life... Financially, outside the tax and regulated white market can be difficult, um, but here are a few ideas that can help you start practicing counter-economics. And yes, I'm literally going to list them because I think it's, I mean, while it might may be redundant, it's uh, necessary to, uh, to, to, to understand what you can do. So, candle making, that's what I do. Lawn care, mechanics, graphic design, selling vegetables, pet care, photography, carpentry, gun safety training. Clothing design, tattooing, performing arts, guitar lessons, beer brewing, artisan craft work, house cleaning, roofing, babysitting, tutoring, Bitcoin knowledge training, computer, computer repair, pedicab, taxicab, food and beverage catering, counseling, plumbing, electric work, fencing, and construction. These are all ways that you can find financial freedom outside of uh, the tax and regulated white market. Uh, but there, there are much larger ways that we can... Um, challenge the state um, through counter-economics. Oh, and by the way, when you're transitioning, I, I like what uh, Jack says about, um, I think you call it incremental agorism, where basically you have your white market job, and um, when you're trying to transition into the counter-economy, um, you want to experiment with different things. And um, I obviously can't speak um, as an, an intellectual authority on this, obviously, because I haven't transitioned fully into the counter-economy myself but I am currently experimenting with certain things, then I, I plan to eventually go dark. But anyways, bigger ways to challenge the state. So what, what can we do when fiat currency and government, government inflation seems to be our only option? We decrease our dependency on, on the, our dependency on the dollar and replace it with cryptocurrencies. We can create barter networks for our friends and family and use precious metals like silver or gold. When government cracks down on peaceful people protecting themselves with firearms, what can we do? Uh, we can do what Cody Wilson did and create the software for 3D printed gun, which basically changed the gun debate forever. <laughs> when, when, um, when government courts are our only option, what should we do? We can patronize third party arbitration in the counter economy. And if there's no third party arbitration that's convenient that we can use immediately, we see it as a, a market opportunity and create one ourselves to provide that service for others in the counter economy. When the white market fails to provide affordable organic food, you do something like Jack did and you start a cooperative and buy it in wholesale. Or you can make a garden, a personal garden and sell, or a communi community garden and share. When, when begging politicians to put a stop to the violent and racist war on drugs, doesn't work, what, how can we possibly make a difference? We can create online black markets to distribute drugs, getting around government laws and the mafias that they protect. Um, I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with the, the Silk Road or, the, uh, or that, that study that recently came out. I, I admit I haven't read it fully, but I did read the, the article. And basically what it's, what, it's, uh, what it's correlating is the emergence or the um, emergence of the Silk Road, um, there's a correlation between that and a uh, less violence in the, uh, the drug trade. You know what I mean? And that's just an example of how we can seriously make a positive, peaceful impact uh, in the world. So when, when the police state grows and cops continue to, build, uh, to beat and kill our loved ones, what can we do? 
we encrypt our communications. We can recreate cadres and call on one another for safety instead of relying on the police, always decreasing our dependency on their so-called public services. There's a debate that we need to have, too. Um, um, Konkin points out in the in New Libertarian Manifesto that throughout all phases, we should continue to educate and recruit people into the counter-economy. Um, I feel like one thing that has really had an impact on um, on, on, on understanding police brutality is the internet and it's people filming them you know but that's that's appropriate now you know what I mean I think that's appropriate now but at, at some time we're, we're gonna have to stop confronting the state you know we're, we're challenging the state and getting in their face I, I think I think it's appropriate to assume that what we need to do in the later phases of the revolution is is work around the state and avoid it all together you know what I mean so so make a a hotline to call uh, to leave a voicemail you know when when a cop is at a certain corner or there's a speed trap going on so we can just just completely avoid it um, what can we do when governments take our civil liberties we see them for what they really are black market counter economic entrepreneurial opportunities to give back to people what was taken away from them when corporate state capitalism has you down and minimum wage laws are counterproductive what can we do? We find ways to escape our, white, our monotonous white market jobs and pursue fruitful business ventures that serve to empower us in gray and black markets. Or in white markets that transact in a gray, which is all businesses, pretty much. Um, when governments continue to cage and kidnap movers and shakers on the front line, what can we do to make a difference? We help their families raise money for legal defenses with fundraisers and other forms of mutual aid. We sign up for already existing defense agencies like uh, Shield Mutual, which helps to protect us through the power of solidarity. So two things, um, Shield Mutual, if you haven't set up with that, if you're an activist, it's in your interest to set up with it. Uh, you can go to shieldmutual.com and do it. So basically, oh, well, George Johnley is the guy who, who started it, and he, he, he's framed it as the first defense agency in the Agora. And it's... Um, I hope you won't get mad at me for saying this. Uh, I don't know if he likes this, but it's activist insurance ultimately. So uh, right now, for 50 bucks a year through grassroots methods, if you were to get, uh, you know, to be hyperbolic again, shot on the front line, you know, go to jail or something like that, he uses uh, a, a grassroots methods to basically like through crowd crowdfunding, uh, um, you know, um, you know, putting money together for your legal defense and stuff like that, um, and then also. Um, I'm not sure if, if anyone is familiar with uh, Ross Ulbricht, but um, yeah, I just I just I just uh, brought up a solution, you know, to what happens when people on the front line, movers and shakers, um, get pinned down. What what can we do? We we create um, we we create fundraisers for for them. And what we did at our last networking party, our sixth networking party. We, uh, we, that's exactly what we did. We started an Indiegogo campaign for Ross Ulbricht. We think he's being uh, treated unfairly. I'm not sure. He's the alleged runner of the Silk Road, um, the alleged Dread Pirate Roberts. Um, there's bogus stories that require no proof um, about him uh, being involved with uh, these murder for hire charges. That's basically how they're keeping him in a cage currently. Anyways, um, he's being falsely accused, and we started an Indiegogo campaign to raise money for his, in cooperation with Lynn Albrecht, his mother, we started the Indiegogo campaign to raise money for his legal defense, and actually I encourage all of you to go to it, just go to Indiegogo, uh, Indiegogo and type in Ross Albrecht, and uh, if you donate money to it, uh, there's, you can get all kinds of goodies, and the final goal, um, if you bid high enough, is a, um, is a 3D printer signed by, by Cody Wilson himself. When governments destroy our communities, what can we do? We, re we rebuild stronger fortresses, allowing people to thrive, potentially incentivizing bureaucrats, cops, prosecutors, judges, and politicians to join our counter-economic efforts. When public schools indoctrinate our children with status propaganda and fail to provide them with real education, what can we do? We create homeschool cooperatives. We build, ed we build online educational cool educational tools and seek out other private methods for education. And finally, when we fail to convince others in arguments that serve only to waste our time, what can we do? We never stop attempting to educate them with our actions. 
So in conclusion, Agorists take the power of peace and truth seriously. We believe that real change can occur through post-parliamentary direct action. We understand that a peaceful society is possible without violent monopolies, and we wish to evolve past institutions by building a counter-economy that will ultimately render them irrelevant. We recognize that bullets and ballots are impractical and outdated methods for change. We know that a better world is possible and one will come to fruition as soon as we choose to get serious about freedom and start building. Be the change you want to see in the world for profit, for goodwill, and for fun. Our goal is the Agora. We want anarchy. We make this happen when we act. Agora, anarchy, action. Uh, if anyone has any questions, um, go for it. Uh, yeah. Pass the mic. All right. I was wondering, um, Adam Kokesh signed up with Shield Mutual, I understand, and there was a huge scandal about that, and I don't believe that they delivered on their promise to... So, something about that. Do, do you know any, any, have any knowledge about that? Because I've heard really conflicting stories about what happened. Yeah, a little bit. Well, I, I don't know an extreme amount, but... Um, George Donnelly wrote up a, an article on it when, when the incident happened. And uh, basically because he, he didn't pay, that's what it came down to. to. To my knowledge, he didn't pay for a service, and that's kind of how the market works. You know, so you don't pay for something and you're not going to get it unless we're thriving in a, in a gift economy. Like, I think I agree with Nick, we'll see a lot of uh, the gift economy going on in the state of society. But, um, yeah, that's, I, he just didn't pay. <laughs> I might be oversimplifying the situation, but uh, George Donnelly would know much better than I do, and I encourage you to go to shillmutual.com. I think it's like the first thing on the on his website that explains exactly what happened. I have a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is is that uh, I highly encourage anybody to go on YouTube and look up the uh, debate between Sam Tonkin and Robert Poole. There is a, a great little bit about in there about uh, when libertarians infiltrate the government and what happens when they encounter people like Agris who are acting outside of the system. So it's 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 a really good debate. Um, the question is is uh, do you have any thoughts or opinions on um, what some people consider uh, that agorism is something that only strictly happens underground? Like for example, some people wouldn't be considering what's going on in Agora Valley as true agorism. Well, I mean, again, in our counter-economic endeavors, we have to measure risk and profit. I mean, I think Agora Valley is an example of, of not agorism, but counter-economics. I mean, counter-economics is what we do, agorism is the ideology. But yeah, I think it's an example of counter-economics. I mean, none of these, I, I doubt any of these people are going to report to the IRS that they sold me lemonade, you know? So, um, yeah, it's an example, I mean, and, and it, it is, underground still, you know what I mean, because it's it's underneath the, the state's radar. Right, but I mean, there's underground and then there's underground. I mean, like, for example, there's, you know, what's going on in the Alcopen out there, and then there's another market that's also going on right now that's just kind of between, you know, individuals making central interactions for, you know, the use of goods. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I think Silk Road is a is a good example of that. Right. Like, super... On an individual level yeah. Someplace. Yeah, so there's levels of it. I mean, people, some people are out in the open, and there's extremely anonymous ways of practicing the counter economy. I don't think it has to be either way, but again, always measuring risk and profit. Um, so this is a bit tangential to agorism, but it was just a comment that you made earlier in the talk that kind of struck me. Um, I, and this is probably a fairly controversial thing to say, but, geez, um, but um, I don't think property destruction is is a, I, you seem to be saying that the people who throw bricks at corporate uh, windows and burn police cars are initiating aggression at least that's the way it came off to me via your wording I don't think that's a helpful I think that's a conflation um, I would agree uh, for example with Scott Crow that property destruction is not the same as engaging in violence uh, violence is when you're attacking uh, this is nothing to do with whether this is advisable or not I'm just saying that I think there's a bit of a moral conflation going on here I don't think that uh, burning a cop car with no cop in it is an act of violence, uh, at, least if, at least if we're defining violence via the presence of physical bodies. Um, obviously there's risk of physical bodies being hurt because, you know, the car could 
blow up or whatever, you know. Um, but as far as I can see, a property destruction and violence are two different things. So I thought that was worth clarifying. Yeah, sure. I mean, without going into the to the debate of aggression, I mean, I was just taking it from a consequentialist perspective. Sure. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, it, I think it's more productive. It, it's instead of putting a bat through a corporate window, you know what I mean? You start a, a counter-economic business. It, it's more fruitful. Right. So. Sure. Kind of look at the guy who ran over the cop cars with his tractor. Perfect example. I didn't even know that happened. Yeah. I, I would look the other way if that happened. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I won't shed a tear. Harold, the cops did not look the other way. Yeah, the cops did not look the other way. I'm, I'm just going to make another comment on this, just and then I'll stop it because I don't want to make this like a you know A B conversation. Everybody else should be involved too. Yeah. So so there you go. Um, I also just want to say I do think there is a purpose with these kind of actions. Again, I'm not saying I agree with them or that they're tactically wise, but th there is a sort of um, idea that doing har harming these corporations or these uh, they could even be a state building or it could be a whatever. Um, they have sort of a value in showing people that hey, these buildings aren't like insurmountable. These structures aren't. For forever, they're not permanent. They actually can be damaged and broken. Cops can be scared, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, not I'm not talking about the morality of this or whether it's tactically advisable, um, but I am trying to just sort of clarify. I think that there there is some purpose, and they're not just random acts of property destruction. I pass it on. Hello. Uh, okay, that's my thought. <laughs> so maybe I have a different view on this. Um, the property destruction side of things is, uh, well, it's interesting because the the justification for property and property jail, and this is actually what I wanted to, to ask you about, how is there property without a state? And property is sort of defined by the ability to call the cop, to call violence down upon someone else for violating this little bound around a piece of the physical world. The physical world exists sort of a priori from people and in our interactions to it. Our interactions to it are a social contract. That social contract is enforced in some way by defining uh, a higher order body, the arbitration, as you said, by defining some abstract property into which everyone needs to agree requires that everyone within that property system has to have the same higher order arbitration. Otherwise, you can simply claim something as commons and I'm re-homesteading this land because I say so. Which probably is more valid than, than not, but the, the big problem with ev defining everything around markets is it also defines everything around property. And defining everything around property defines everything around its arbitration system. And the arbitration system becomes the central part of uh, any humor, human interaction. So the, the problem with private property lies in the fact that it is defined by calling down violence upon your fellow people. So, uh, you know, structurally speaking, property is violence, you know, or, or to quote Proudhon, property is theft. Out of the commons, I claim this is mine and will call violence upon you if, if you enter into it. So the, you know, the deeper problem with back and forth of, of do you destroy property, do you not, what right does anyone to have the, to actually have a decision-making authority over a piece of the physical world versus someone else. Sure. <clears throat> well, the Perdon's uh, uh, quote for property is theft. First of all, uh, if property is theft, that implies ownership. So I don't, I don't even like that. But to put it in full context, and ownership is 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 is, is property. Um, but to put that quote in full context, I think Nick Ford or, or Jack would probably be be better suited. He was basically. Uh, like the property was like being stolen from them from the ruling class and when he was talking about property he was talking about um, like were the ruling class's ownership of it you know what I mean I don't think he was I don't think he was my naive opinion I don't think he was dissing the idea of private property altogether and and as far as how would property exist in a stateless society well I'm not a geo libertarian I, I think through homesteading you would consider property, but you'll see different communities work things out in different ways. So if you and your community decide that property is illegitimate, like I said in my speech, then that's completely fine. You know what I mean? I'm skeptical, like Konkin, of a voluntary uh, primitivism or, or, you know, communism. Or not communism, but primitivism. 
But um, I, I think you'll see community, you know, geo libertarian communities. I think you'll see primitivist communities in a stateless society. I think you'll see uh, communities that prefer hierarchical business structures. I think you'll see communities that are more, you know, um, flat uh, and egalitarian. And I think in the end, the 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 system that works best is going to attract the most people and and outcompete the other systems that don't work as efficiently or meet what people value. I hope that answers your question. And we can talk about it later. But that's a good question. Anybody else? Oh, um, I've got shirts on the table. I've got zines. Oh, and oh, last thing about the the market. Sorry, I thought about this. So. <laughs> Um, there's the, the uh, Charles Johnson points out there's the, the, the cash nexus side of the market and there's the gift economy. So it, market to me doesn't necessarily, um, uh, I mean it's the sum total of all voluntary human interaction. So I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a big umbrella to work under and uh, I have a, maybe a more, I guess if you could say liberal definition of market though. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a member of the uh, Charles, ja uh, Charles Johnson fanboy nit nitpick club. So I'm just going to say, um, so when, when Charles is talking about two different types of markets, I think it's actually good for libertarians to talk about the definition of markets. Because, you know, we're all busy, like me and Jack and Scott Crow yesterday, we were talking about libertarians against capitalism, but we didn't really never really define markets. Um, I think markets, defining markets is a very good thing. Um, and I'm kind of torn on this. Like, I, I feel like the sum of all voluntary relationships is a really vague, general sort of definition that seems to stretch out markets in any given direction to the point of meaningless. Ness. But at the same time, I also like Charles Johnson's kind of reworking of it, which is that the the space of most, uh, the space of the most maximally sort of consensual um, social activity or something like that. I can't quote it exactly. Are basically our markets. Um, I still like that definition, although I, I'm not exactly satisfied with it. Um, but he doesn't say gift market, gift economies are another kind of market. He's saying that mar the the one kind of um, market is the kind that a lot of, um, especially I think Kevin talks about, which is the cash nexus. So you know everything goes through money and everything goes through exchanges. Um, there's nothing really else. Um, the second form of markets that he talks about, uh, and you can find this on uh, bits and pieces on free market anti-capitalism. You can find it on uh, Charles Johnson. Uh, website radgeek.com um, and I can give you a more precise link if I had access to the internet right now um, but yeah basically he talks about two different kinds of markets and the second kind of market um, is just a a space in which basically uh, actions or relationships are voluntary and free uh, again I'm not completely satisfied by that definition but I'm really not sure what else we could do with markets because I reject capitalism so I'm not going to go that route but um, I also um, I also don't really like definitions being so, you know, I'm kind of like Benjamin Tucker. I don't, I don't like definitions being so slimy. So, um, slimy is the wrong word, but you know what I mean. So, so loose, I guess, is really what I should have, should have said. Yeah, thanks for the correction. I knew I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs>